The title of my talk is Communication, Humanism, and HIV Psychiatry, a Paradigm for Psychosomatic Medicine. And uh, this is a quote from an article by Barron in 1985. Quiet, I can't hear you while I'm listening. So as I said, I have nothing to disclose but thanks, and I have a lot of thanks. Thanks again to my family, my patients and trainees, to the APM members, SIG members, and leadership, and to influential teachers and pioneers, and to all of you. And what I'd like to ask you to do when I um, put on the next slide is to just take a minute to think about the pioneering work that you do. Oh, the pictures didn't come out. That's strange. Hmm. Well, there's a picture of every single one of those um, on the slide. I don't know why they're not there, but oh, maybe they're coming. It's really strange, but, ah, oh, well, the names are there, but not the pictures. Hmm. I have another flash drive. Maybe we could try that, but, um, well, only one picture. Well, everyone had a picture, and um, I'd like to say special thanks to the people we've lost that we had pictures of, but they disappeared. Now, these are the influential pioneers and teachers that, um, that are still here with us, and they include some of the wonderful teachers that I've worked with and absolutely um, was influenced by. And that, of course, includes many of you here and people that um, I've worked with over the years. How is that possible that the pictures can just disappear. Well, I don't get it. I guess um, technology is not my forte. So while we looked at those, and I thought we'd have pictures to look at, I want to tell you that this is the time to think about the pioneering work or ideas that you have, the work that you do, because I really think that Psychosomatic medicine psychiatrists are pioneers. You know, you solve medical mysteries, you advocate for your patients, you collaborate with every single subspecialty and, and discipline in the hospital, you develop and direct psychosomatic medicine services, and you take care of, of patients with severe and complex illness and teach other people how to do that. You develop services, organize ethics committees, serve as service chair of medical staff committees, lead the, the Academy of Psychosomatic Medicine. You write the textbooks and the handbooks of psychosomatic medicine and integrative subspecialties that you actually found and lead, such as psycho-oncology, psychonephrology, transplant psychiatry, palliative psychiatry, pediatric psychosomatic medicine, and bariatric psychiatry. You've developed innovative programs for smoking cessation, <clears throat> survivors of torture, new treatments for delirium. You've led an, an employee assistance program, provided diaries in an intensive care unit for your trainees to record their experiences. You've written the textbooks and handbooks on bioethics and psychopharmacology of the medically ill, prostate cancer, motivational interviewing, complementary and alternative medicines, medical treatments in psychiatry, and end-of-life care, palliative psychiatry. And your research continues to provide growing evidence base for our practice. So today, my plan is to ask you to do one more thing and add a pioneering effort to your work if you've not done so already, and that is HIV prevention. You don't have to be an HIV psychiatrist to teach other clinicians to do so and to prevent HIV. After nearly 35 years, 
HIV is still an epidemic, and we can collaborate to prevent HIV, to prevent HIV discrimination, and encourage HIV care. So no one has to experience what was, you, was previously, thanks, a rapidly fatal, severe illness that our patients had to deal with before treatments were developed. Oh, what? Is, it, is there something wrong with this? Um, I, I don't know why we're not seeing any of the pictures. The other stick is in my purse. <laughs> If you bring it up here, I can get it, or So it takes a village. I don't know what happened, but um, we have, I have three of them, and they should, one of them should work. So there's my teacher explaining. Did, did you hear? Okay. Okay, here's the other one. I think you have to show it from my flashback, not from my... Oh, that was sad. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So Jim's always coming to the rescue. He um, started electronic medical records and electronic consultations long before there were such things, right? Um, and now we're going to rescue a, a, a nice uh, presentation because you, you miss the pictures, you miss the point, actually. So um, to just continue a little bit along that line, that was a picture that was seen in Life magazine of the way patients looked. Actually, um, actually, Michael had one um, up there as well, but I got one from Life magazine who, who really looked exactly like the patients we were seeing because there was a degree of cachexia and disfigurement that was really um, extremely difficult for patients to live with and deal with. And what we can do today is really prevent that from happening. And unfortunately, ah, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Jim. So just to, um, I'll just go quickly through those beautiful pioneers that, that were um, on the slide. And um, they also include two very, very young people who, who died much too early, um, Wayne Caton and, and Michael Kilby, who's an HIV um, clinician, uh, an internist and infectious disease specialist who died this summer as well. So um, to go back to the slide we were at, so this is what people looked like um, sometimes when we were taking care of them, when, when Jimmy Holland and I were taking care of patients. Memorial Sloan Kettering had a lot of AIDS patients because they had Coppice sarcoma, CNS lymphoma as well. And now that has really changed enormously. So that um, that was one of the reasons that I founded the SIG because no longer did um, the ASPOA society with with cancer and AIDS need to exist because cancer was not very much associated with AIDS after um, the int the introduction of medical treatments. So new infections in America are primarily uh, now occurring in the South. So we're in the right state for this talk. Nine out of the 10 states with the highest fatality rates for HIV are in the Southern United States. 
what I learned from my friend Helen, who's a, a psychiatrist here in New Orleans, is that Louisiana has the third highest United States HIV prevalence. They're also, they also have a very, very high incidence of new cases. In 2015, the HIV epidemic was, um, was actually described in rural Indiana in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, the reason that it occurred was inadequate, inadequate treatment for addiction, criminalization of sterile needle exchange programs, HIV exposure, and sex work. And of course, lack of education about HIV and HIV care. New infections can be prevented by education about HIV prevention, emphasis on sexual health rather than abstinence. Prohibition didn't work in the 1920s. There was uh, an amendment passed to um, actually um, end the prohibition era, which occurred from 1920 to 1933. And people died because of prohibition. They, um, it didn't stop people from drinking. So addressing uh, HIV stigma and discrimination can help prevent HIV. And decriminalizing sexual activities and needle exchange, uh, it's uh, uh, sexual activities are criminalized in 33 of our 50 states. Providing collaborative care and outreach by HIV clinicians and access to pre- and post-exposure prophylaxis in persons at risk are part of comprehensive prevention. So patients who are engaged in care and on antiretroviral therapy are living longer, healthier lives with the usual longevity for age-matched individuals. And they're not dying of AIDS. And this was a photo from the San Francisco um, experience that appeared in a recent New York Times article. So AIDS in America is really forgotten, but not gone, the title of El Satter's article in the New England Journal, 1.2 million Americans are living with HIV, and of those 1.2, 26 are 26% 26 are over 55 years of age. 50,000 new persons are infected each year, and half of those live in south, the south, southern states of the United States. One in seven Americans with HIV is unaware of being infected and can unknowingly become ill or infect others. And routine testing is now recommended for everyone from 13 to 64 years of age and anyone at risk. So HIV can be prevented both before and after exposure, but not all physicians know that. And I know that because a patient of mine was exposed uh, in an unprotected sexual encounter, and I sent her to her gynecologist to be evaluated for um, use of prevention uh, medications that, that are uh, um, tenofovir and emphysitabine. And she called me and said, well, why should I give her anything? Uh, that's only used for post-exposure to, for, um, occupational exposures, it's not used for anything else. And I said, well, it's not only used, but it's part of guidelines. It's 2015, and it's been used for years as, as prevention, and should be part of every single rape kit, and, and every part of everybody's armamentarium, and a gynecologist should know that fact. And she really didn't, and that was in 2015. I provided a prescription for, um, Trivada, for what is Trivada, which is a combination pill with um, the combination of tenofovir, 300 milligrams, and enprosidabine, 200 milligrams, and the patient took it, probably preventing her from getting infected. HIV is the most common potentially reversible cause of dementia in persons 50 years of age or younger. 
the estimated prevalence of HIV in persons with severe untreated mental illness is 10 to 20 times that of the general population. And communication can make the difference between life and death and is not, only, is not always easy for clinicians or their patients. And that was what I thought was so interesting about the article that Barron wrote in 1985. He was an internist. He's an internist in Philadelphia, and he was auscultating his patient's chest, and the patient began to speak, and Barron responded, quiet, I can't hear you while I'm listening. Communication is key to development of trust and rapport, as well as to adherence to risk reduction, behavior change, and medical care. It wasn't easy in 1985, and it's even more complicated in, nine, in 2015. And we heard quite a, a wonderful uh, plenary session about that from Rita Charon uh, yesterday. Um, and my new internist, I don't look like that, but my new internist looks exactly like that. He asked me if I'd mind if he turned his back to me during our first visit. I said, no, it's fine. <laughs> I'm not going to read this because I know that we don't have that much time, but one of the most beautiful descriptions of what patients really want from their physicians are, are really part of what narrative medicine is all about, and we heard about that yesterday as well in a beautiful presentation. But what he said was, I want to be a good story for my doctor to exchange some of my art for his. To most physicians, my illness is a routine incident in their rounds, while for me it's the crisis of my life. Just as he orders blood tests and bone scans of my body, I'd like my doctor to scan me, to grope my spirit as well as my prostate. In learning to talk to his patients, a doctor may talk himself into loving his work. He has little to lose and much to gain by letting the sick man into his heart. If he does, then they can share, as few others can, the wonder, terror, and exaltation of being on the edge of being between the natural and the supernatural. And I, we heard, I think it was today, in a plenary session, that if you are patient-centered when you take care of patients, you actually spend less time and waste less money. So communication for HIV prevention, treatment, and compassionate care, um, I'm not going to read these off. You can, you can see them. We can actually prevent HIV transmission and HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders. If you can actually get someone who's been exposed to um, get... Um, tested and get Truvada or tenofovir and emtricitabine within 74 hours, that exposure won't lead to infection, won't lead to the establishment of independent reservoirs for HIV in the brain. So prevention is recognizing and prevention, preventing risk behaviors when possible, encouraging early testing and prompt treatment on diagnosis, this is beautifully um, done in an article um, in the New England Journal in 2015 with 4,685 patients followed for three years. They had to stop the study because the people who were getting uh, delayed treatment were getting events um, and progressing in their illness. Engaging in care and treatment with antiretrovirals as soon as possible can prevent transmission can prevent the establishment of independent reservoirs and prevent dementia. But communication for HIV means talking about stuff that nobody wants to talk about, talking about taboo topics, um, taking a substance use history, a relational history, a trauma and a sexual history. Prevention means using condoms, and for persons at substantial risk, taking emtricitabine and, and um, tenofovir. This was a picture of, of a store at Sharon's wedding in Puerto Rico where, um, 
right down the block from our hotel, there was this great store, and it had um, this picture, and I thought, wow, that's better than the old slide about the two safes having sex. <laughs> so uh, what's really the, the message is really that treatment can be prevention of HIV. So just as women can take plan B following an unanticipated, unplanned, or, for, un, or forced unsafe sexual encounter, anyone can take HIV treatment as prevention or post-exposure prophylaxis after unsafe sex. It's no longer just for occupational exposure, as my, my patient's gynecologist thought. An HIV-negative member of a serodiscordant couple may take pre-exposure prophylaxis alone or in combination with condoms, preferably. So this is a, another picture from the New York Times about discussing pre-exposure prophylaxis. So this is also backed up by a lot of science and also has become guidelines throughout the world. The WHO guidelines uh, were published in uh, September of 2015, and the National HIV Strategy for the U.S. was updated. And I'm proud to say that um, the a APA Office of, of HIV Psychiatry actually asked for input from our steering committee, and people here in the audience all contributed to that. We contributed it, and um, it was actually adopted by and appears in our new uh, guidelines um, and came out in July of 2015. So Antoine and others put and uh, chaired by the steering committee was chaired by Larry McGlynn, um, put together a fantastic um, set of recommendations that were incorporated into the guidelines. So for people at sub of substantial risk, if there's a, a, a serodiscordant couple, um, they can protect themselves from um, transmitting the virus. And also, I, I, I'm not covering this in today's lecture, I saw all of the, for the about eight years that I spent as director of AIDS psychiatry at Mount Sinai, I saw all of the pregnant women with HIV, and they, their program was absolutely wonderful. They had a very comprehensive OBGYN program that um, I was part of, and all of our babies, I went to all the labor rooms of each of the deliveries, and no one no one actually got HIV because they were in engaged in care, and um, they had an integrated program and that led to uh, adherence to care and healthy, healthy babies. So treatment is prevention, um, prevention of developing the independent reservoirs. I'm not going to go over that again. Um, just want to talk a little bit about, um, I, I would love you to guess who said these things, because two of them are AIDS and two of them are not. So um, can anyone guess who said, um, uh, the author who describes himself as ironically healthy, his illness as torture and loathsome, and names it humiliation, although it has another name? Is that AIDS or is that another illness? Anyone recognize it? John, Up John Updike, exactly, psoriasis. Who said that? That's great. Yeah. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> Not fair. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that was uh, John Updike. So psoriasis. Psoriasis and his descriptions are really, really painful to read. Um, a teacher describes himself as herself as, I feel broken. That's an HIV patient. Um, an artist describes himself as poisonous, unclean, embarrassed, and shameful. And a physician keeps his illness a secret from his friends as well as his doctors and describes his illness as defeat and shame. So which one is an AIDS patient, an AIDS patient, do you think? Any guesses? Rita probably knows the answer, but no? No? no. <laughs> Which one? The physician has AIDS? 
it's Dr. Max Pinner, Pinner, 1952, I think, and he um, describes his uh, cardiac disease that he was horrified and would not even talk to his family or his doctors about. Cardiac disease. So the artist, that's my patient, poisonous, unclean, embarrassed, and shameful. Communication asks, uh, really does include asking understanding of illness. And asking understanding of HIV is really important if you're going to know anything about the patient. Because unfortunately, it's still more stigmatized than most medical illness. And these are things that patients say. It's embarrassing. It has an effect on your mind, body, and soul. The perception is that you're not a very nice person anymore. Everything is limited. Before, you could do whatever you wanted. Relational and career goals seem like a fairy tale. I feel awful about myself for lying to my friend. I've lost all my goals. And the one patient who at Mount Sinai said, I, I cannot come in the front door of the clinic. I've got to come in. There must be a back way because I can't sit in the waiting room because someone may recognize me. That's a level of stigma that's still here and still with our patients. My patient who needs to get Sculptura for terrible facial atrophy can't get it, went to six plastic surgeons before he found one who was willing to do it, even though it is paid for in New York, in New York State by um, insurance and uh, Medicare. So HIV's discrimination and stigma remain barriers to communication for prevention and care. AIDSism, HIV stigma, and criminalization of potential exposure considerably, ha considerably hamper communication in HIV prevention and care. Potential HIV exposure is criminalized, as I said before, in, in the U.S. and in some countries throughout the world. It is actually still um, punished by execution. So stigma, discrimination, and fear may prevent persons with risk behaviors such as unprotected sex, injecting drug use, from getting tested, learning that they have HIV, or accessing care. Once diagnosed, stigma and fear of discrimination and rejection prevent persons from disclosing HIV status to family members, close friends, or even intimate partners. And non-disclosure leads to transmission and may worsen, HIV stigma may worsen depression and lead to suicide. So I'm just going to, I think I have just a few minutes to present a, a little um, case that I think will illustrate the kind of work that, that I've been doing and the kind of um, teamwork it takes to take care of somebody with HIV. Mr. A is someone that, that I and my former director, uh, co-director of AIDS psychiatry at Mount Sinai, as well as a, an infectious disease specialist were taking care of um, because, and, and actually I've been following him with the infectious disease specialist in my practice since I left Mount Sinai as well. So Mr. A uh, was a patient who um, is a 60-year-old married grandfather and disabled former chef with HIV, HCV, COPD on 24 hours four liters of oxygen, rheumatic heart disease, heart failure, cirrhosis, Paget's disease, PTSD, major depressive disorder, heroin dependence, and full sustained remission for, I think it's 24 years now, on methadone, um, alcohol dependence in full sustained remission for about 20 years, nicotine dependence in full sustained remission for, for three years. I got him off of smoking on jigsaw puzzles. And he has been chronically suicidal since his HIV diagnosis. He responds well to individual psychodynamic and family therapy, as well as venlafaxine and bupropion. 
He's currently taking a GED course and decided that since his first grandson is going to college, that it's time for him to go to college too. And since he spent his years, um, since he was 11 years old, um, uh, through his adolescence, taking heroin because he was introduced to it by his two uncles, both of whom died of AIDS, he really missed most of school. So because he missed school, and because he probably has some learning disability, he really didn't get to really learn how to take tests and to read and to do the stuff you have to do to graduate high school, and he didn't graduate. But he's a very, very wise, very smart man, and he decided that he wanted to be a better role model for his grandchildren, and he's secretly, with me, learning how to read. And... Um, I, I finally got him to talk to, to reveal his secret to one of his brothers who paid for him to take a GED course, which he's in now. And I'm also having him tutored by another heroin addict who's not in remission, who I think would be a real uh, help to him in learning to read because she's smart and literate and is doing nothing with her time since she dropped out of college because of heroin use. And now that she's on methadone, the two of them are going to work together. So between family therapy, getting him to talk about his suicidality rather than lie about it, when he became suicidal, he would go into the hospital and say, I'm just going in for a medication adjustment, but his suicidal feelings and thoughts and attempts were very real, like getting straddling a 17th story building window, like buying a gun to shoot himself, like taking massive overdoses. So he is actually not at all suicidal right now, and he quotes me periodically and tells me why, because I have to keep asking him, because it's always a risk. Um, he's doing better. He's doing better because he has a goal and he has something in mind that he really wants to do and he wants to work toward. Now that his grandson is in college in his first year, he wants to go to community college after he gets his GED. So we're working on that, and I thought the most interesting thing happened. I was worried uh, a couple of years ago when his um, HIV clinician called me and said, you know, I'm going into a different area of, of HIV research and I'm not going to be in the clinic. Do you think it would bother your patient, Mr. A, to um, be transferred to another physician? And I said, no, I don't think it would be a good time. Do you think you could kind of hold out until I get a little further with him? Now, this is after 16 years of work. 16 years of work. Um, the first, uh, I think the first six of them were by my, my co-director, and then the last were, the last 10 were my own when she left. Um, he said, well, okay, I'll, I'll stick with it for, you know, as long as I can, but, you know, it's going to be really hard because I'm not normally in the clinic anymore. So he was kind enough to work with me on it, and we worked together with him and a social worker, and we, we uh, worked it out so he didn't, he didn't transfer care. But then he wrote to me and called me recently and said, look, I really have to, I really have to be full time in this other area and I can't continue in the clinic. Um, are we ready now? <laughs> and luckily, because of the school and, and the other things that were coming up in his life, and the fact that his grandson graduated from high school and his younger grandson is doing really well, um, he's got a lot to live for. And um, the internist, the HIV clinician said, well, would you tell him? Because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, uh, okay, I guess I will. And he said, oh, great. Um, so I said, but, you know, we have to make it a gradual transition. So we did. We did it over a period of, of weeks. I, I, I found the best moment that I could tell him, and I did. And um, I also told him that he would have the cell phone of his, in, of his HIV specialist that he loved. He would have contact, 
that he was going to be transferred to um, a fellow who was trained by him and also the fellow would be an attending and so would be staying in the clinic and would be working with him. And it was an attending that he knew, would, it was a fellow that he knew because whenever, um, whenever my, my uh, whether, whenever his uh, clinician was out, he would cover for him. Uh, she would cover for him, and so he actually knew her. So, um, of course, he agreed, and, you know, first he said, um, he, I could tell from his look that he was going to become suicidal. I mean, just the feeling that we've connected with over the years, and I said, you're, te you're telling me okay, but you're looking like it's not okay. And he said, well, and his, his head was hanging really low, and I said, well, um, what can we do to get you through this? And um, when uh, we did get him through it, we, we had, I, I did nightly uh, calls with him. We talked every night. Um, I got him to start working with this young woman who's a heroin addict that he's helping uh, stay uh, free of heroin. And um, and on methadone, she was just getting her methadone dose increased, so she was still in danger, and he was in danger. But between the two of them, they really um, motivated each other, and it was quite an experience. So I've been in touch with them, and as of today, um, they're still both going strong, and um, Mr. A is is not suicidal. So. That's the kind of thing that I, I, I find really um, gratifying. And I know that Mr. A is going to be somebody I, I miss and will feel terrible when he does actually die, but I'm sure that he will die of his multiple medical illnesses and not jumping out the window. And he, by the way, um, got rid of the gun and um, hasn't made another suicide attempt, even... In, despite the fact that his internist, uh, his HIV internist left um, the system uh, that he was a part of. Um, so I think it helps to know all the things that we can do to keep people with HIV and HIV stigma alive and not, not killing themselves. So I'm just going to run through the rest of the slides because I think we made the point, but um, there are a lot of people out there now writing about um, the fact that um, stigma and discrimination are barriers to communication, and Crowley in 2015 um, talked about the multidimensional factors that magnify HIV stigma, including sexual orientation, gender identity, use of injection drugs, um, ethnicity, poverty, severe mental illness, and homelessness, and I would add to that uh, trauma and um, HIV-related um, on uh, violence. So um, these have been described as a syndemic or synergistic epidemic, and um, I leave time for some questions or discussion. The SAVA epidemic is linked to non-adherence to care and was written about and talks about the complex intertwining of abuse experiences with sexual risk-taking, drug risk-taking, substance abuse, mental health, health care utilization, HIV medication adherence, and disclosure. So psychosomatic medicine psychiatrists can encourage clinicians to take sexual histories, can encourage patients of any age to have safe sexual encounters, to take a substance use history and provide care and motivation for change and treatment, to take a trauma history, ask about childhood trauma, assess for PTSD and provide treatment, ask about sexual victimization and gender-based violence, about intimate partner violence, and to provide appropriate care, referrals, and resources for trauma survivors. And one of my patients who was severely sexually abused and um, is now um, really having problems like having unprotected sex, um, <clears throat> she found the survivors to, uh, the survivors to um, thrivers 
um, website um, at www.askasupport.org. It's a really excellent one. <clears throat> Non-adherence to medical care complicates illness and worsens prognosis intensifies pain and suffering, cause irreversible, causes irreversible complications and strains relationships, leads to treatment cascade and increases mortality and morbidity. You need adherence, 95% adherence to antiretrovirals, 100% adherence to safer sex, and in the United States, only 29% of persons with HIV have, re have achieved viral suppression. But in some centers in the United States, such as centers where there is integra integrated care, 80 to 90 percent have, have achieved retention, and over 80 percent have achieved viral su uh, suppression. So Mugavero and colleagues found that missed HIV clinic appointments are an independent associated, are an independent, are independently associated with all-cause mortality in HIV. So non-adherence in HIV has public health implications for, for HIV transmission. It has implications for suffering, increased morbidity, and increased mortality. And HIV psychiatry is really a paradigm for psychosomatic medicine, collaborative, integrated, and comprehensive and compassionate care. Comprehensive, complex and severe medical psychiatric illnesses with a magnification of disparities and vulnerabilities and stigma. And it requires a biopsychosocial approach and integrated care. So this slide just really says it all. It's in, it's in the downloaded slides. It, it really puts it all together. And um, this one is a, an upsetting one because adherence means disclosing as well as using condoms, but people lie for sex. They fear rejection, abandonment, and stigma. And the clinical pearls include prevention with early childhood trauma through parenting education and risk prevention and HIV diagnosis at every age through older age. Prevention means encouraging routine testing as well as safe sex, condoms, and post and pre-exposure prophylaxis for patients at substantial risk. Encouraging treatment for substance use or safer use of substances. And prevention make, means making condoms available in all medical and psychiatric facilities. I've asked many times at places where I've given grand rounds, do you have condoms on all of your uh, psychiatric floors and in your psychiatry clinics? I guess I should ask the question here. Are there condoms openly available in big bowls in your, in your, in your uh, hospitals? Anybody? Not enough, just a few hands, and that's kind of distressing. There are places, San Francisco has them available and other places, but in uh, most places, still in 2015, there aren't condoms available. And yet, um, I used to see all the patients transferred from um, Manhattan Psychiatric Center and um, when they were pregnant from, in, uh, in, from inpatient long-term psychiatric facilities, and they were getting pregnant there, psychotic and pregnant, because there were no condoms available. And if you think that two patients are going to go up to a nurse and say, may I please have a condom so we can have sex, they're not. And um, what happens is they get Women get pregnant, they get transferred, they're psychotic. Some of them that were transferred were, um, were overtly psychotic, um, and we would see them on the obstetric floors. And I'm sure that those of you who work in the, in the field have seen that as well. So if pregnancies are occurring in, in high schools, in elementary schools, and in fact, the elementary school that I did some work in before I fell in love with the field of HIV, of um, psychosomatic medicine and later HIV psychiatry, children were graduating from elementary schools pregnant, which meant that there wasn't enough education and there certainly wasn't um, help for kids who were having sex because they were getting pregnant in elementary school. So treatment needs to be comprehensive and tailored to meet patients' needs. Each person needs an assessment focused on sexual health as well as 
mental health and needs a careful assessment for neurocognitive disorders, trauma, PTSD, substance use, depression, and anxiety. And no, no one size fits all in the care of people with HIV. And prevention can prom promote adherence to safe sex, drug treatment, routine testing, harm reduction, needle exchange, and treatment can improve adherence and decrease suffering, morbidity, mortality, and AIDSism. Thank you.